Hi. Uh, today what I wanted to do was go through what it means to create a bread formula. We've gone through about 16 videos so far in this series and it's gone through some steps uh, to try to understand what it is to make the bread. Now I want to at least kind of delve into uh, what it is to actually create your own formula and your own bread that you actually you know, may have a, a desire to make. I had many questions throughout uh, the last few months, uh, both in uh, comments as well as email directly to me, about certain aspects of the, the formulas that I've shown and why certain choices were made and what made them uh, as such and what was their effect. Okay, so to do so, what I wanted to first do was kind of break down uh, the, the very, very basics of what it is to try to, to create a formula. So as, as you know, on breads, you're gonna have flour, water, salt, some form of a, a yeast uh, or a leavening agent, which would be either a sourdough or uh, maybe a pre-ferment, poolish, bigas, uh, sponges, things of that nature. Uh, whether you're gonna put inclusions in, then we'd have to go through what is gonna be the mixing type and the bulk fermentation, uh, the proof times, and then uh, the final bake. So when we do this, I want to kind of go through each of those steps and then uh, just try to get an understanding and give options as to which way you want to go. All right. So, so let's, uh, let's begin the video and go through this. Hit uh, uh, subscribe and all that if you want to kind of go back because uh, you can catch all of the videos that we've done where we went through on uh, um, how to make sourdoughs, how to do pre-ferments, uh, 10 or so different breads. Uh, what it is for different baking ingredients, and, uh, and then just the overall baking process. So uh, hit the subscribe button and, uh, and then just catch up to what we're doing. All right, thank you. All right, so the very, very first thing you wanna do when uh, trying to create a bread formula is obviously have uh, the end result in mind. All right, so you wanna think of the flavor profile. When, when I have uh, customers uh, that I have to formulate for, or when I've worked for corporations where I'm you know, doing uh, research and development and product commercialization, what I end up doing is when I talk directly to the customer is I ask very specific questions as to what it is that they want. Uh, you know, generally it would be uh, first, the flavor. Do I want it to have either a strong flavor or a light flavor? Do I want it to have kind of a sour flavor? So I, I start to think about uh, a lower acetic uh, level or a more lactic level uh, where I would want, say, my pH to be. Uh, so that, that general uh, acidity flavor profile. Then I would start thinking about what is the texture of the bread? Okay, so that will in indicate a direction of the types of flours and the type of fermentation that I'm gonna be after. Uh, then I want to think of the mouthfeel. So when you're chewing the bread, uh, do I want it to be uh, more of a, a chew and a pull? Uh, do I want it to be just a nice clean bite? Do I want it to be something like that? So then at that same time, not only the mouthfeel, but also the bite. So what, when you take that bite and that chew on it. Uh, so again, those are all going to lead to different directions as to what kind of flours I need, what kind of fermentation I need. Do I need fats and sugars, oils? Uh, uh, honey perhaps. So each of these things go through and so I kind of break it down first. Flavor profile. Uh, what is my end result, my picture in mind? Uh, what is the texture going to be? What is the mouthfeel going to be? And then what is the bite going to be? Those are just very basic guidelines to try to begin uh, that, that concept as to what you're after. So when I do that, then when I have those in my mind, then I'm gonna to start to think of what are the ingredients that starts to put those, those flavors together? Am I after a, a complete rye flavor, a, a whole wheat flavor? Is it gonna be a, a more mild, just white, uh, white flour flavor? Uh, is it gonna be a, a combination of the two, like we've done on, on many of our videos? Am I gonna combine two, three, four flours? Uh, you can go further into specialty flours or ancient grains at the same time because those each have uh, very distinct flavors as well. So start thinking about the ingredients. What is my uh, flour combination? Now remember, this is a work in progress, so this is not right out of the gate you're going to get this perfect. This, you, you try it and then see what it is. Uh, so let's say if I, I want to have, like when we did uh, Pan 
I had, uh, I don't remember exactly, but I had a, a larger percentage, I think 65% white flour, uh, then about 25% whole wheat, and then 10% rye. And so a total of 100% of the flour uh, combination. Knowing breads and knowing what I wanted, I wanted to get something that had a, a deeper integrity to it, a deeper flavor. But I also wanted to have uh, a, a, um, a better, uh, less dense uh, crumb. So I had a, a larger percentage of white flour rather than just straight whole wheat. When you have 100% whole wheat flour, like we did on, on, on uh, the 100% whole wheat sourdough, that is gonna be a much tighter crumb, a much chewier crumb, all right? So uh, also when you do 100% rye, very similar. So start to think of what those can contribute to the final product and then just play around with those flavors. If you're going to go into the specialty flours, those are going to have, and we're not going to do it in this video because that's a much deeper conversation, but are you going to uh, um, just add a small flavor profile from that, or are you going to try to make the entire bread or a large percentage of it from it? When you start looking like that, you also have to think of the strength contributions that those flours provide, right? So white flour and whole wheat flour provide a lot more uh, gluten and a lot more uh, um, extensibility and elasticity to the dough. Rye flour starts to pull a little bit away from that. Uh, and then we start doing with the, the uh, specialty grains or the uh, ancient grains. Those again are weaker overall uh, for the, uh, the contribution to strength. Also, like say spelt. I, I uh, would only put a small percentage of spelt in most breads because it is a, a very, very different flavor. All right, so you, you have to, to really, really believe where you're going with the flour combination. Then, are you gonna go into enrichments? Do you wanna have a, a dough that is entirely lean? Lean meaning there's no sugars, no fats, no oils. Uh, the majority of our, our videos have had that, uh, uh, where they were completely lean. But on uh, ciabatta, I put a small percentage of an olive oil in there. That is to provide a little bit more of a deeper flavor as well as a, uh, a texture, uh, and then just that, that uh, chew as well. So there's, there's those combinations that's come from that choice. So when you do have enrichments, which could be uh, fats, which is oils and uh, uh, butter, um, you know, different, uh, uh, I doubt we would put margarine in anything, but you can do that, uh, shortenings. Uh, are you gonna put sugar in? Uh, just straight sugar or is it going to be honey is it going to be you know a certain percentage of that because sugar also has a contribution factor that either provides a sweetness level to a certain point but then it also takes a little bit away from the strength those are aspects that you have to think about uh, do you want to put milk in your product you know so again it adds a little bit of that uh, fat flavor uh, it also adds to the liquid component so flours enrichments and then inclusions. So in addition to the overall uh, flavor profile from there, you may have that, uh, it's almost like the icing on the top of the cake, that it's going to be something that is a, an additional contribution that generally provides deep, deep flavors, uh, as well as different chew profiles, uh, and then also strength um, characteristics. Generally, it takes away from the strength. So like, let's say you have seeds, uh, or you have nuts, dried fruits. Uh, you don't necessarily put in uh, fresh fruits. You can, but dried fruits work better. Uh, and then uh, perhaps if it's going to be a sweeter bread and you want to put chocolate or something else uh, in there. So then you have to think about how those are going to be uh, an effect on the flavor. Is it going to be in the dough? Is it going to be just on the top of the dough? Uh, is it going to be a part that is going to be added towards the beginning of the mix, towards the end of the mix? Where is it going to be? So again, flowers, enrichments, and inclusions. Those are the big main ingredient profiles that you have to think about, which all contribute to your overall flavor profile. Okay. Okay, so we first talked about trying to put together the flavor profile, then the ingredients that would contribute to that flavor profile, as well as you know, the texture, the, uh, the mouthfeel, the bite. Now, the big one. How are we going to determine the type of fermentation? What are the, the aspects of fermentation that I need to draw from to be able to contribute to what my end product is going to be? All right, so 
If I'm thinking of a hamburger bun, it's going to be very different. If I'm thinking of a baguette, it's going to be very different. If I'm thinking of a, a, a long fermentation sourdough, it's going to be very different. Uh, if it's going to be a croissant or a, uh, a bagel even. All these things have different aspects of what fermentation provides to your end result. So you first, you have a picture in your mind. You understand what kind of bread you want to make. And you've got your ingredients. So you've got the, the, uh, um, you know, the paint in front of you. So now you've got to start to sketch it together. Right? So now, with the type of fermentation, do I want to have a, like as I mentioned uh, before, uh, a more sour flavor or less sour flavor, a zero sour flavor? Do I want to have something that has um, not too much of an alcohol tasting flavor or do I want to have uh, a more alcohol tasting flavor? Do I want to have something that is just, for the most part, totally bland and then lets the inclusions or the, uh, the sugars and fats be the, uh, the, the thing that shines? So, do I want to do something simple? So, if I want to have, uh, let's say, a straight dough, where I'm basically just going to put together flour, water, salt, yeast, uh, I'm not going to add any kind of a pre-ferment, I'm going to, maybe I can add an inclusion if I want to, and I just want to mix, make, bake my bread, I'm in and out in a few hours. It could be very good. Uh, it can make excellent hamburger hot dog buns. It can make some of the, uh, the enriched breads. But if you're looking after the more deeper flavors and the more complexity of flavors that uh, we've been doing in much of these videos, we're going to go one more step beyond a straight dough, which is using pre-ferments and or sourdoughs. All right, so I'm going to put them in uh, both in a pre-ferment category, but it's like 1A and 1B. 1A is the list of pre-ferments. 1B is going to be strictly just sourdoughs. All right, so we're going to break down each of those uh, as is. On pre-ferment, uh, meaning uh, things that are made with a commercial yeast. Okay, so you buy your, uh, you know, your dry instant yeast. Do I want to make uh, a product that has a pulish? Pulish we've used in baguettes and ciabattas, the Francesi. Great, great, great contributor to flavor a different type of uh, strength aspect, and it can be a combination of flowers when you want to do this as well. So do I want to make it with a pulish? Or do I want to make it with a sponge, which uh, you know is another aspect of it, it's a lower hydration. Do I want to make it with just using my uh, pre-fermented dough, which is basically what we would term old dough. So do I take the dough that I had from a prior batch of bread that I made and held it to make my second batch? Uh, or is it a biga, which uh, I'll get into kind of the understanding of what that is or the, the uh, definition of kind of what that is nowadays. Or do I want to go into what are these sour cultures? All right, so let's first start with a poolish. Poolish is always going to be at 100% flour and 100% water. The length of time that I want it to ferment, so how deep of the flavor that I want that to be, is either uh, an overnight generally about 12 to 16 hours, or do I want to just ferment it for like, say, 8 to 12 hours, or do I want to just ferment it from like, say, 3 to 5 hours? So that's a, a choice that is both the flavor contributor, but also your own time constraints, your own personal time constraints. So on a poolish, generally, uh, if we're baking at home, which that's what all these videos are about, I, I have the time. And I'm going to prepare myself, but I got to do it the night before. So if I want to make a poolish and have it ready for the morning bake, I'll make it uh, later in the afternoon or evening the night before. And I will use 100% flour, 100% water, and uh, maybe 0.1 to 0.2% commercial instant dry yeast. All right? We generally don't buy at home uh, fresh yeast, so I'm not going to make those conversions for you. We're going to use dry instant as the, the base for commercial yeast. You let that ferment anywhere from, like I said, about 12 to 16 hours. As you've seen in prior videos, you can go back to our poolish baguette where we, we went into depth as to what it should look like when it's fully ripe. It has risen two to two and a half times its volume, and then it just starts to dome and slightly recede. When you start to see it slightly recede, that's when you know it's ready. That's at the, the peak time. 
You generally have only about maybe an hour uh, from that time, maybe up to two if it's a cooler room, to where that is available for you to use in your bread at its best. But try to hit it within that first hour uh, for that. A sponge, a sponge is going to be a variable of water. So it's still gonna be 100% flour. And again, you could have 100% uh, white flour, you could do say 80-20 with whole wheat being 20%. Uh, you could do a 50-50, uh, you could put a small percentage of rye in any of this, but a small percentage, 5 to 10%. Those are choices that you want to do to contribute to the flavor. Let's just, for the most part, what we're going to think about right now is just going to do at all white bread flour. So on a sponge, still going to be 100% flour. On the low, low end, you're likely at about 55 to 60% water, on up to generally maybe say 70%, 75%. But it, it can vary, you can do it anywhere in between. All right, that is your choice. What happens when you do that is going to be how its strength characteristics and its flavor profile is gonna to contribute to your final bread. I can't necessarily go into the entire explanation of what that would be, but uh, I'm gonna refer you a little bit later to a place where you can go buy a book and see exactly what I'm talking about in, in a deeper uh, conversation. So on a sponge, you're thinking anywhere from say, 50 to 55 percent on up to 60, 70 percent, okay? That is going to give you, uh, instead of where the poolish provides a lactic acid flavor profile, this will be the lower you have on the water uh, and maybe even the cooler fermentation is going to bring you down to a more acetic level of fermentation, okay? So it's going to be a more stringent. That's going to be on a sponge. Pre-fermented dough is going to be any lean dough that you have, any lean dough. Generally a white flavored uh, uh, or white flour based lean dough because then it doesn't change the flavor profile, but you can pretty much use any lean dough. You don't want to put in something that has fats and sugars and such. Try to keep it on the lean side. If you had made bread the day before, you have some scrap dough left over and you didn't bake it off, you can stick it in a little cambro, put it in your refrigerator, and then use it the next day. All right, so when we use a pre-fermented dough, we, we try to say pre-fermented dough. If you keep saying old dough, it has that connotation that it's just no good. That's why we call it a pre-fermented dough. If it's been refrigerated, it's not gonna have uh, lost its uh, flavor, or gone too sour, too uh, alcoholic. Uh, it's still gonna be in good, uh, good shape. Or even a couple hours later after you baked that prior batch. When you do that though, you're not going to add that pre-fermented dough at the beginning of the mix. That'll be added in the last few minutes of your mix uh, uh, for that. Reason being is that you already have a fully developed dough. You don't need to break down that dough again and then rebuild it. So uh, again, when we're using a pre-fermented dough, you're gonna retain that little bit and that's gonna be a contribution towards the end of it. If you have inclusions, it's basically gonna be about at that same time, all right? Then there's also on what's called pre-ferments, arbigas. Bigas uh, is basically an Italian term for a pre-ferment. Right? It used to mean, more in the antiquity aspects of Italian baking, was a very low percentage uh, uh, pre-ferment, so about 50-55% water, 100% flour, small percentage of yeast, then it fermented at a low, long fermentation overnight, 60-65 degrees total. Uh, room temperature, everything. It makes it a more acetic flavor. Nowadays, and actually talking to uh, Italian bakers, now the, the biga is kind of a broad term that respects basically kind of a poolish aspect, a biga aspect, or whatever in between. Uh, so it's a more generic term nowadays. But if we were to refer to a biga as opposed to poolish big, uh, um, sponge, it's gonna be that one that's gonna be at that very low hydration in the cooler fermentation. Okay, so. Think about that, and that would be many, many variables of strength, of flavor, lactic, acetic, uh, and then the length of the fermentation for that pre-ferment. All right, those all have different contributions. We'll get into where those contributions are gonna lead you further into the development of a formula. Okay, so let's now talk about uh, the sour cultures and what they can contribute to your formula. Uh, as we've done on many of the videos, we've used uh, a couple different sour cultures. Uh, uh, I generally keep as my go-to every time a uh, 
sour culture that is 50% uh, white flour, 50% whole wheat. And from that, which is a, it's a, a perfect combination of flavor for me for the majority of my breads. And I, I don't want to get into always having to retain and, and feed and go through having two, three, or four sour cultures. So if I need to uh, make a different flavor profile for a bread, what I'll do is take this as the seed and then feed it into the flours that I would use for that different uh, sour culture. So uh, if I'm going to make a, a rye culture, if I'm going to make a straight whole wheat culture, or if I'm going to make just straight white uh, flour culture, I will take this as my seed uh, at a certain percentage, feed it maybe two or three times uh, over the course of a day and a half or so, and that should be enough to convert it uh, it may take a little bit longer on the rye, but between the white and the wheat, it's a little bit less. And so I only deal with uh, either, like I said, a white, a wheat, 50-50 uh, wheat and white, uh, or a rye, 100% uh, culture. I don't want to make uh, my life so difficult to try to maintain all of these, these different ones. So think about that too, because the more complex you make things uh, and the more you um, try to make something so deep, so much, okay? It's like uh, the, the kid that's finger painting, that, you know, he's, he started on the finger paint, he, he took a two, three, four colors, and he, he spread it around a little bit, and it looks beautiful. But then that same kid keeps painting and painting and moving his hands over, and that entire sheet turns to like a big wet brown sheet. That's what happens when the majority of the people I've ever dealt with that try to formulate for the first time, they try to make things too complex. Okay. Simplicity is generally best. Let those particular ingredients do the shine. Let that shine through the bread. Right? Inclusions are a little bit of things that are added on top uh, and not uh, the, in, the direct entire flavor profile. All right. So when we talk about sour cultures and I've got my seed, which here is uh, my culture right there that is already fermented. It's a beautiful culture. I keep this at all times. If I'm not baking, I will refrigerate it. But uh, I've got a little wine cooler that's behind me that's perfect. I set it at 45 to 50 degrees. And after I let it ferment, I'll put it in there, and then I don't need to use it for a week. If I don't bake, I'll pull it out, feed it two times, I'm ready to go. I started this last night. Fed it this morning, then I was done. All right? So when I do that, I can always keep this as my seed and then go into the others. Okay, so from your mature culture, the mature seed, uh, or the starter, uh, what I'm going to do is take a percentage of this, and if I want to go into making a, uh, a white uh, culture, I'm first going to think, do I need to make it a liquid culture? Because I use 100% flour to 100% water on my, my, my daily one. Uh, but if I wanted to make it, uh, and this is going to be more of a, the, the lactic uh, flavor, uh, so do I want to make it either a uh, liquid sour culture or do I want to make it a stiff sour culture? So the hydration aspect. So if I'm going to do a, a white sour culture and I take a little bit of this seed and feed it into 100% white flour, am I going to add it to 100% water at maybe 10 to 20 percent, probably 20 percent of my seed, and then feed that three times, maybe four times over the few days before I'm going to bake? Uh, or am I going to make it into a stiff uh, white flour culture, which would be anywhere from on the very, very low end, 50 to 55 percent, but generally about 60 to 65 percent for a stiff culture? So do I do that uh, and then feed that for the next uh, two days, three, four times? All right, so it'd be still at 100% white flour and anywhere from say 65 down to maybe like 50 to 55% uh, of that uh, in water. And again, it probably about 20% of the seed. All right, once it perpetuates itself and if you wanted to maintain it, then you can see how long is it fermenting and how long is it uh, time to get ready. So I, I can't give you an exact time because Room temperatures change, uh, water temperature, generally I mix it around 60, 65 degree water temperature. Uh, and if I'm gonna ferment it overnight, I lower the percentage of the starter. If I'm gonna ferment it during the day and bake in the afternoon, 
I'll increase that. But generally it's in that, say, 10 to 20, maybe 25% of the seed. And then you perpetuate it with that white seed going into the white flower, white seed into the white flower, all right? Same thing would be if I'm gonna convert it over to a whole wheat, 100% whole wheat sourdough culture, okay? I, I don't necessarily need that for most things, but if I were to do a bread that I have to label as 100% whole wheat, and I needed to have that, uh, uh, you know, say in a regulatory situation, I'm gonna convert that to 100% whole wheat starter, right? So that I have no compromise that says that this has a small percentage of white flour. So I can, again, take the same seed, feed it into 100% whole wheat flour, water temperature again around 60 to 65 degrees. Do I want it to be a more liquid whole wheat culture or do I want it to make it a little bit firmer culture? I generally go to a more firmer culture because when I have too much water in uh, the sour culture, it ferments quite fast. It can ferment in five hours, six hours, seven hours and such. And when I have that, uh, so I also have to think of the percentage of that seed going into it. Because again, there's more food available when I have 100% whole wheat uh, in there rather than a, a combination of white and wheat or just strictly white. Uh, generally, my percentages run down to that 10%, maybe 15% of the seed. All right, again, perpetuated with the same culture back over and over. So after I start with this seed, I'll feed it three, four times with 100% whole wheat flour, maybe 65, 70% water, and then perhaps 10% of this as a seed. Then the second feeding would be actually that whole wheat sour culture fed back into it, just like you would any other culture. So when you get that, you also have to think of what that's gonna contribute on the flavor. It's gonna be a little bit uh, deeper flavor than the white culture. And then again, liquid or stiff. All right, so that again, one more aspect of your flavor profile. If I wanna go and make a rye flavor culture, I would take again, my original seed, go through a very similar process, 100%, uh, or I mean, uh, well, 100% rye flour but on rye, I, I go, because rye absorbs so much water, uh, I tend to make it actually anywhere from 100 to 120% water. Uh, generally, actually, I go up to 120% if it's a darker rye because it absorbs so much water and it makes this beautiful, kind of like, uh, almost like a balsamic vinegar flavor profile. It's, it's, rye is a great sour to use. So I would perpetuate it again for a couple of feedings to try to get it to convert over to a rye uh, sour. I would do it for a few more days, more like three or four days rather than one or two days to, to make that conversion. But again, just go through a very similar process. And once I've got that, and then I wanted to add that to uh, a dough, rye does not strictly have to go into a rye product. Okay, wheat does not have to strictly go into a wheat product and white does not have to go strictly into a white product. You can make the combination and the contribution. You can take 100% white flour base, add a whole wheat starter to that with your water and salt and everything else and mix your dough and have a great, great flavor profile. You can take rye sour culture, add it to either a white or a wheat flour based dough. All right, so you can think of combinations that will make a contribution to that. Uh, I've, I've made breads where I took uh, like a low extract flour, so it's not strictly a 100% whole wheat, uh, be like a, a type 80 flour, which would be a little bit less than whole wheat. And I've added rye culture to that, and it took that whole wheat flour or that wheat flour flavor and made a, a wonderful flavor combination. So don't think you're limited to, to those you know, strict guidelines. But we've also shown with uh, our rustic Italian that both on flavor and texture and strength and uh, cell structure, everything involved with the, what your choice of preferment is, the, uh, it doesn't have to be only a sour culture going to make a bread. You can take a poolish uh, and or a biga, add it to also a sour culture in the final you know, dough formulation, and just you have to create balance Okay, so uh, again, what each one of those contributes to the final product, think of where that goes. It's just one more layer on top of another layer on top of another layer. That's where you can take, and that's what's the beauty about bread, is that it's such simple ingredients, generally what flour, water, salt, yeast, some form of leavening, right? And how it is that you ferment it, 
okay, is to be the complexity of those flavors. So you can make hundreds, literally hundreds of types of breads from using about three, four, five ingredients. It's just how do you manipulate that time, that temperature, those flours, All right? So each of these has such a, a, a deep contribution and uh, it's going to lead to your flavor profile, your strength profile, and then the length uh, of that fermentation. So then the next step is going to be how we're gonna think about the procedure by which we've done this. So, All right, so we've made uh, our choices as to the picture in mind that I've got for my bread. I've made choices for uh, the flavor profile, the contributing uh, factors of what those ingredients will, will, will give, uh, as well as my fermentation. Did I go with pre-ferments? Did I make a straight dough? Am I thinking of sourdoughs? Am I doing combinations of them? So now that we've got all of these, these layers and layers and layers of flavor and fermentation and strength characteristics that come from it, now I gotta think about how I gotta put it together in the mixer, right? So how do I mix this dough? If I'm doing something uh, uh, simply a straight dough and it's just a flour, water, salt, yeast combination, no pre-ferments, I have to develop the dough according to the level of yeast that I have, All right? So if I have a higher percentage of uh, uh, instant yeast, let's say it's 1% or one and a quarter percent yeast, and this dough is only gonna, uh, with my dough temperatures hitting between 73 to 75 degrees, Am I going to ferment that first fermentation at only about an hour? That's about all you have, maybe 45 minutes, even at that level. I need to mix my dough to nearly full development. All right, so it's gonna be a longer mix, a, both a low, long speed, and then I will have to kick it up to a, a higher, stronger speed to fully develop that dough. Because my, the entire, uh, reason and uh, choices that you make for fermentation and the type of mixing and uh, bulk fermentation and proof is to get from the point of how long is that period of time going to be, how far I need to bring my strength characteristics from the mixer to final proof to going into the oven at full strength. All right, so if I have a, uh, a very short dough so I have a high percentage of yeast, I need to mix my dough nearly to full uh, uh, strength, 90% or more, knowing that my first fermentation, my bulk fermentation is very short. And then my proof is also likely to be about the same and it's going to be very short. And I'm gonna say a 45 minute bulk and a 45 minute proof, I'm in the oven. I needed that dough at nearly full strength coming out of the mixer. If I made that choice, and I went to a, a lower percentage of yeast on a straight dough, so maybe at say 0.3%, 0.3% commercial yeast, I need to mix it a little bit less, allow for a longer bulk fermentation, likely to, to contribute to folds. That also depends on not only hydration, but also the length of the fermentation and the strength you get out of the mixer. Then how long is that proof gonna be to then build, build strength till I get to final proof to be at nearly full strength going into the oven. These are the things that really are more difficult to make the choices and it's a trial and error until you to get a better understanding of where these things lead. All right, bakers take generally, you know, several years to really fully understand how that, that journey is to get to the oven at that point. Straight doughs, it's a little bit more simple because again, it's just flour, water, salt, yeast dictated by the percentage of yeast. Dough temperature generally for a commercial yeasted product is gonna be between 73 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit. If I'm going with a pre-fermented dough, and that means I have either a poolish, a big sponge, uh, a pre-fermented dough that I've added to it, I'm gonna have different ideas about this also. All right, so if I have uh, a a longer first fermentation, which is likely going to be my choice when I have a, a pre-ferment to it. Uh, it. You know, so again, if it's a low percentage of commercial yeast in addition to my pre-ferment, then what I'm going to do is mix it a little bit longer, I mean a little bit less, allow for a longer first fermentation. I will dictate whether I need folds 
as, as I've seen and you've seen in the videos, I make choices as I go along. But if you've done it a few times, you know what to expect. And then I will allow for my shaping and proof to, again, be at a certain point. So again, you're trying to make that journey to get to that point from the mixer to bake to be full strength. And all of those are from the cont contributions of the mix, uh, both first and second speed or dough development, uh, incorporation and dough development. Uh, and then what are my pre-ferments, and then my length of that fermentation. All right, so keep that in mind. You don't want to mix full strength and then ferment it for three or four hours and then think that you're going to have a good dough. You would have already spent it. You would have already broken uh, that, that dough strength by that time. Same as with sourdoughs, but it's, again, one more complexity because sourdoughs, just in, in general, are going to take a longer period of time. They are going to allow for, on, on the very low end, maybe two to three hours bulk fermentation, uh, generally like three to four, even sometimes five hours of bulk fermentation. That is going to be dictated not by commercial yeast, because if you're doing strictly a sourdough, it's going to be without commercial yeast. It is going to be just the percentage of that sourdough that is going to go into it. So if I'm looking at maybe on the low end, a 20, maybe 10% on up to 20% of a sour culture in my final dough, then that is going to be a longer period of time of that bulk fermentation. If I'm upwards of 30%, even 40%, I don't like going that high, but some people do, uh, on the sour culture, that again is a flavor profile choice as well. That is going to be a journey that is going to allow for, is it uh, a longer, slower mix, or a little bit more development on up to full strength by the time I'm done. But generally, all sourdoughs are going to be a longer, slower mix, longer fermentation, longer proof. All right, just because that, that doesn't have that, uh, that speed of, uh, of what a commercial yeasted product is. Now again, if I want to make a sour culture, and I did this in one of the videos to show, uh, or at least I mentioned it, if I want to shorten that time frame by just a little bit, okay, because of my time constraints or maybe even the flavor profile that, that it's going to be maybe too acidic by the time it's done, do I want to take and make a, a formula that has just flour, water, salt, the sour culture, do I want to put a small percentage of commercial yeast? I, I never generally go past maybe 0.1%, maybe at most 0.2%. That just helps me to reduce that bulk fermentation time and final proof. So instead of maybe three hours, it's two. So instead of maybe uh, four hours, it becomes three. Those are choices, again, and it's both a combination of your own personal time spent doing it or the flavor profile that you don't want it to be too acidic. All right. Okay, so now as we've started to think about how we want to mix the dough and we've gone through what are the pre-ferments, is it a straight dough, is it a sour dough, what is the length of the bulk fermentation, what is my projected proof time, uh, we now have to start also thinking of one more contribution that may help when you're using different types of flours. Uh, if you're using whole grain flours, like whole wheat or uh, rye uh, or the ancient grains, specialty flours, the absorption rate of those flours takes a little bit longer and, a, and more, um, it's more necessary to allow for the water to have a chance to absorb into that flour. And that's when we use something that's called an autolyse. And that is basically just taking uh, the, the water, the flour combinations, and sometimes the sour culture uh, or the pre-ferment. No commercial yeast yet and, and no salt yet. You add that to the mixer, mix it for a few minutes to just incorporate it. And then you stop the mixer and allow it to just rest. And during that time, anywhere from on the very short side, usually about 20 minutes, it could be 30, 40, it could be even an hour because you're not trying to start any fermentation. But what you wanna do is, so let's say 20 to 30 minutes, let that flour absorb uh, the water that you gave. Then you come back and then if you had commercial yeast, you would add it and if you had salt, you would add it and then continue to mix and finish the final mix. That's called an autolyse. It's a very good contributor to the dough strength and the final uh, moisture level that you're gonna finally achieve in your bread, All right? So, one thing, autolyse. Now you also have your final, uh, what we call the desired dough temperature when you're mixing. That is gonna be on a commercial yeasted bread, 
going to be anywhere from 73 to 75, as I mentioned. And then for sourdoughs, they like it a little bit warmer. So I would go anywhere from say 75 to 78. You can even push it up to 80. But uh, if you have a cooler room temperature, obviously you're gonna go to a higher uh, dough temperature. So on the higher end of that spectrum. Uh, and if it's a very warm uh, bakery at that time or your house, uh, keep it at the lower temperatures. You may even have to go down lower, maybe 73 degrees, but uh, sourdoughs want to be a little bit warmer. Okay, so to do a formula, to make a formula, all right, and there's a reason we call them formulas, not recipes, all the rest. These are ratios, these are percentages. These are things that when you hit within the guidelines of what they are, follow the procedures to what it is, they work each and every time, okay? There are some aspects of humidity or room temperature or the flowers uh, quality and strength. There's all these little or smaller factors, but they are not the, the most determining factor. The most determining factor is the, the base formula, making and understanding the procedure. As I've said in many videos, and I will repeat it a thousand times when I train people, the baker is only responsible on uh, basically controlling the time and the temperature. If you follow the procedure and the formula and you control the time and the temperature as the baker, you will generally get the same result each and every time. But it is a challenge because when you do have a bakery and you have to produce literally the exact same bread every single time, every single day, day in and day out, try doing that and see how well you can do it, okay? That, that's what kind of separates good bakers from you know, average bakers. You have to be able to kind of take it all, make sure that you follow those procedures, follow those steps, and then control the, uh, the two determining factors, which is time and temperature. So when you're sketching your formula, if you've got flour percentages, you've got water percentages, you've got your salt percentage, which is almost always going to be 2%. Very, very rarely would it break at that 2%. And if it does and it goes lower, it would be at maybe 1.8% on up to maybe 2.2%. That's, that's the range that you're gonna do on salt. Let's say you added olives to uh, uh, your dough that has a salt flavor profile. I would maybe pull it back to maybe 1.8% for something like that. Uh, on the other side is if you just want it to be a saltier flavor, but very little, only go up to 2.2. So that's the range base standard 2% salt, all right? And that salt is going to be based on total flour. Very important to think about that, total flour. So if you have your flour component that you have in the base formula, but you also are adding a sourdough, that sourdough has flour. Whatever that amount of flour is, you add it to the total of the regular flour, dictate how much that is, and then you multiply that by 2%, getting your uh, amount of salt that's going to go into it. Remember that. On a pre-ferment, as you look back on the video from uh, the um, uh, Simple Baker's Percent, and then also when I've shown you on the baguettes, go back to those videos and you'll see how you would take a straight dough formula, pull out a percentage of the flour that you want to ferment, ferment that in the pre-ferment, so either the poolish or the baguette or the biga as such, and then that is going to be brought back to the remaining ingredients that you had on that straight dough. That's how you would take that, that part to it. So you've got your flour, water, salt, your pre-ferment aspect, uh, and then you've also got your inclusions. If you're doing inclusions and it's going to be seeds uh, and or nuts or you know the dried fruits, chocolates, all that, that percentage, I base it off of the total dough formula. So if I have my, my dough base, I'll then add on top of that, maybe a five to 10% inclusion amount, all right? And that is gonna be uh, depending on how much you want it to you know, be a part of the flavor profile. And also remember the inclusions tend to take away from your cell structure. Uh, it'll make it a little bit slighter because it breaks it, it shreds it as you're doing it. When you're adding inclusions, you're not adding them at the beginning of the mix on almost all aspects. You're going to add them at the last few minutes of your final mix, okay? Or you can mix your dough to the full point, put it back to uh, low speed, and then just add your seeds, slowly incorporate it so as to not add additional dough strength.
All right, so that's, that's another aspect that you need to remember. So you made your choices on the flours, the ingredients, you made your choices on the bulk, for, I mean, on the, uh, the pre-ferments and the fermentation. So then you also will see how that will lead you to how long is going to be that bulk fermentation. Again, a lower amount of ferment or a lower amount of commercial yeast. It's going to be a longer bulk fermentation as well as uh, a longer proof, right? There's not strict guidelines to it. So these are variables and ranges, but you will see trial and error as to where you're at. This is just to help you lead in those directions a little bit. Then you also need to think of, you know, when you do that, if you have a higher amount of yeast or a higher amount of uh, culture, it's going to be a shorter bulk time and a shorter uh, final proof, All right? When you get to that final proof and you finally got your bread to where you want, obviously there's gonna be a bake uh, time and temperature that you're gonna be looking for. If you did a lean dough, uh, as you know, in the hearth breads that we've been baking in all these videos, obviously it's going to be uh, um, a higher temperature, probably 450, 475 uh, Fahrenheit in the, in the uh, home oven. And I've been baking generally most breads at around 700 uh, grams to 800 grams at about 35 to 45 minutes. Again, it depends on uh, how your oven is, but you, you can decide that it's pretty simple to do so. You also want to make sure you get good proper steam. Uh, involved with this. So again, the cast iron and the, uh, I used a little lava rocks, uh, the uh, uh, water, as well as I used crushed ice, not ice blocks because it takes too long to melt and create the steam. So crushed ice. That means it gives you a little bit of time to close the window, close the door, and then it'll continue to steam. All right. And then the regular water is there to start it immediately. So with all of those aspects there, that is your final bread formula and process and final end result. There's so much that's involved to make these things that you really, really need to give good deep thought to it. Uh, there's several books out there that you can get that uh, can help lead in this direction. Um, my personal uh, uh, choice would be uh, from the San Francisco Baking Institute. Uh, I think it's uh, uh, called uh, um, Baking Techniques, a Professional Approach. It's by Michelle Suez, my old boss. It's a fantastic book. Uh, I was lucky to be a contributor in that as well. Uh, but there's also, there's another book, I forget the author's name, Flour, Water, Salt, Yeast. Very, very good book. Uh, but there is also another book, uh, book that's just called Bread. And that is by Jeffrey Hamelman at the King Arthur Flour uh, Company. Again, a, a friend of mine, I worked for him. Fantastic book. It kind of leads you in some of these directions, give good, deeper, fuller explanations. I just wanted to make a video that would uh, introduce you to some of these ideas and get you thinking about these things. But I would reference back to a true textbook, a true book to get and be able to go back, and back and back and look over these things and get a better understanding. So look at the uh, sfbi.com, order the book, fantastic. You'd never have another question about bread after that. Now, some of you may also want to ask about retarding breads. That's an entirely different video. It is uh, taking, again, the entire same thing that we just did, going through it, but then you have to adjust each and every one of the ingredients, each and every one of the bulk fermentation, the sours, and how you want to treat them. It's just too much to try to get into uh, in a video uh, such as this. So I hope, uh, there's another one, by the way, sprouted wheat and sprouted grains. That I want to do on a separate video as well, because that is another different technique, different process and such. But I hope this, this does give you the ideas to where to go on some of the formulations or things that you want to do or answer some questions or at least lead you to the idea that you need to ask a question and reference something in a book. All right. There's a lot of experience that's needed to get through these things without making it too hard, but that's the fun part of the, about the baking. All right. I, I love doing it. I hope you do too. If you like the videos, subscribe to the videos. Hit the subscribe button, hit the like button. Uh, we're starting to get a good uh, turnout on views and, uh, and uh, uh, subscriptions and memberships and such, whatever it's called. Please go through and do that because it helps the videos and such. And you can email me uh, and or uh, look at our website, which is kingdombread-tampa.com uh, and obviously on our YouTube channel that you're watching right now. All right, thank you.